I'm Salma Schimmel. We're here in Milan, Italy. It is the 35th ESMO meeting, the European Society for Medical Oncology. And while we're interviewing our European physicians, we're also spending time with our physicians from U.S. Dr. Jordan Berlin, you're here all the way from Nashville, Tennessee. You're at the uh, Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center, and what is your title there? I'm the director, the clinical director of GI Oncology at Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center. And one of the big cancers involved in GI Oncology is obviously colorectal cancer. Yes, and in, in, in the United States, colorectal cancer represents the largest of the GI malignancies. So you did present a study at this meeting? Yes, at this meeting I presented a randomized phase two trial, which is a very large randomized trial um, assigning patients to either uh, a drug called GDC-0449 or a placebo. All patients received standard chemotherapy and all patients received a drug called Bevacizumab or Avastin, which blocks the formation of new blood vessels and then they were randomized to add to that either the GDC-0449 or the placebo. What stage of disease? All patients in this trial were, uh, had metastatic disease or stage 4 disease, uh, which means it spread to other organs. Some of the patients had, had had diagnosed and resected and their cancer had come back, and some patients had just been diagnosed with the disease already spread. What sets this study apart from some of the other uh, studies involving Avastin in colorectal cancer? Well, I think one of the things that sets this study apart is um, it is a new target that has not been tested before uh, in colorectal cancer. So most of the recent studies, especially all of the randomized trials, have involved either what we call VEGF inhibitors or EGF inhibitors. Avastin or Bevacizumab is a VEGF inhibitor and it's been shown to be active in combination with chemotherapy and colorectal cancer. This drug, GDC-0449, targets something called sonic hedgehog. Hedgehog is a target um, unto itself that has very unique properties. Sometimes some tumors like basal cell cancer and medulloblastoma, two rare cancers um, in terms of um, very aggressive forms, uh, can have mutations in what we call the hedgehog pathway. And those, those have already shown, been shown uh, to be treatable with GDC-0449. Other diseases like colorectal cancer have tumors that express a lot of this hedgehog, this, this little protein that binds to other proteins and turns on, um, causes the turning on of cells to stimulate the cancer cells to grow. So the other thing that makes it unique is the cells that are turned on by hedgehog expressed by the tumor, what we call the stromal cells. These are cells that surround the cancer or are with the cancer but aren't the cancer cells themselves. These stromal cells then produce factors that tell the cancer cells to grow. So here the tumors send a signal to the stromal cells and the stromal cells send a signal back to the tumor saying grow which is a bad thing if you've got a cancer. And the um, GDC-0449 is supposed to block those uh, stromal cells from sending off the signal. So we're targeting the cells around the tumor that we have learned increasingly are very important in how cancers behave. How does one know, how do you determine if a patient has this hedgehog characteristic? So we actually, as part of this clinical trial, we asked for patients' tumor samples. Patients always have a biopsy to get the diagnosis. And we asked for a little piece of that biopsy that are often saved in pathology labs to be sent to us. And we actually were able to look at the expression. We looked at that at the end of the trial. So we looked to see how much hedgehog um, the patients were expressing or creating from their tumors. And we did that at the end of the trial to see if that actually correlated with the effectiveness. Um, it did not in this case, but in the laboratory experiments, it seems to correlate with, with the effectiveness. Of note, we treated the patients with several things in addition to the hedgehog inhibitor, so sometimes you may see a washing out of any effect there too. And the trial took place across how? The trial took place at 35 centers across the United States. It was uh, 199 patients were enrolled in the trial. Um, approximately half of whom got treated with the hedgehog inhibitor and half of whom got treated with the placebo. And uh, unfortunately, 
uh, the results were such that the uh, hedgehog inhibitor did not add to the regimens we were giving it with. So we did not see any benefit for the patients in receiving it in combination with first-line chemotherapy. What does that mean when you invest this kind of time and you know, hope into a, a study? What happens now based on the results that you've just shared? Well, the important thing is that, um, of course, there, there are a lot of factors that go into deciding about a study like this. And in this case, there was a lot of good, solid laboratory evidence. We had seen activity in other diseases, such as medulloblastoma and basal cell cancer. Um, we, uh, we felt that a randomized phase two, a larger study, would really be able to give an idea of whether or not this was adding to regimens that were already effective. When you do small studies where you're giving regimens that are already effective and adding another drug, it's often hard to see if your drug has really added to the effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So this was a nice, solid study, large enough to be able to say, this goes forward or it doesn't go forward. In this case, the drug's not going to go forward in this setting. It does not mean definitely that it's not active in colon cancer. It may be better that it doesn't go with this chemotherapy regimen that we used. Uh, it may be better that it doesn't go with the Avastin. Um, there may be other reasons why it didn't work, but it was not active with this combination. So it tells us that a large randomized phase three trial, often consisting of close to a thousand patients, is not necessary, which was important. Mm -hmm. So what are you working on now? You are at this one. You you you've assessed the outcome of this study. Where is your next area of focus? So. Uh, um, we're at Vanderbilt, we're focusing on several areas. Um, we have a large program uh, called a SPORE uh, project where we look at um, how to make, um, in particular in the clinical realm, how to make EGFR inhibitors, they're one of the sets of drugs we use, more effective or how to overcome the resistance. In addition, we're also at Vanderbilt um, developing our own drugs. We found some new and interesting targets that our uh, existing colon cancer, and we're developing our own drugs to help um, to help treat the colon cancer. And of course, these are still in the laboratory setting where we're treating colon cancers in the laboratory on tissue plates and sometimes in mice. What is the relationship here in America and here at a European meeting? Much like at ASCO, there are many Europeans at the American meeting. These are international focus meetings. Give us a little insight as to what it's like getting together with your European peers and how you can compare data and what are the strategies that you as an American clinician impose when you are working with your European counterparts. Well first off I have to say I'm a member of ESMO. Um, it's a wonderful organization and um, over time the with especially with planes and with other things the European-American barriers have completely broken down. Um, I guess we can credit Skype as well. Um, but the bottom line is that we, we meet with each other regularly. Um, ESMO is just another example of our interaction. There at ASCO, there's a World GI Congress sponsored by ESMO or co-sponsored by ESMO that happens in Barcelona and there's a large contingent of Americans co that come to that. Uh, we are constantly crossing the pond, as it were, um, to discuss things. It helps us to work out the differences because there are differences in how the two continents treat patients. And of course, there's some differences on, from country to country, even within Europe, uh, partially based on health care programs, partially based on their approval processes, and partially based on favoritism in terms of trials. Um, the um, commonly used regimens in the United States for colon cancer, Fulfiri and Fulfox, were largely developed, frankly, in France and, um, and other European countries. Mm -hmm. The Germans developed a different regimen infusing 5-FU in combination with the Irinitec and Oroxaloplatin, and they prefer their AIO regimen. Today, uh, the Nordic uh, group presented their favorite um, mm -hmm. uh, chemotherapy regimen. So there are differences on the chemotherapy regimens, not necessarily a lot of difference in the effectiveness, just the schedule and the doses that are given but the drugs are the same. And it's a nice way for us to be able to interact at all these meetings and get the data together so that we can compare across trials and really come up with what's the real best way to treat our patients. Clearly we've seen really important advances, dramatic advances in the treatment of colon cancer over these last years. And 
it also speaks to this whole idea of combination therapies. Still using chemotherapies, but now combining them with these exciting targeted therapies with more and more molecular and biologic agents in the pipeline. Yes, and I think, I think it's important to realize that with combining these new targeted agents, this is a wonderful opportunity, wonderful chances. It's also a wonderful chance to take the science and really move forward. Um, not every time when we have great science do we end up with positive results in the clinic. This is one example. But the great science can help guide us because we have so many options for treating now and only so many patients and so much time to be able to do the studies that we really have to get the great science to go forward. And, and um, I think we, we have been doing that and I look forward to seeing a lot more new targeted agents moving in in a wise fashion into the treatment of colon cancer. And some will be very active and some won't. And even if something, as you said, doesn't prove to be as active as you want it to be, it's not all lost. We don't know also the impact that that may have on other diseases. And every bit of knowledge that you gather really just strengthens the research process and raises the bar of hope in some way or another. Right. The markers and the other data that was gathered on this trial will help. And in addition, as, as our discussant pointed out, this was a well-designed trial. And it's important because the trial gave us a clear message what to do. And that's very important because with an unclear message, you could treat hundreds if not thousands of patients. Instead, of, well, while 200 seems like a large number, um, 200 is nothing compared to what we've treated with several other agents. So I think it's important that we do these powerful trials that answer the question for sure, and then you can move on to the next drug. Or if you, if you have a positive trial, you move it into an even larger trial, but you have a much better success rate. And I think it also instills in patients, you know, a sense of trust. When things work, they work, and when things don't work, then it's acknowledged and we don't sacrifice a patient's quality of life, and we deal in a, a straightforward and honest manner. Yeah, I prefer that method, too. Thank you very much, Dr. Berlin, Dr. Jordan Berlin, an American here in Milan. Are you enjoying Milan? I'm enjoying Milan a lot. Thank you. You are the uh, director of the GI program at Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you.